to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ trust in the lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding Acknowledge Him in all your ways, and He'll direct your path. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Welcome to our study of the beautiful and wise book of Proverbs. Proverbs is all about the gaining of wisdom for the practical use in everyday life. Some books we open to, say for example, like the book of Romans or the book of Hebrews, may have a strong doctrinal emphasis. And yet Proverbs is unique, like the book of James in many ways, in that it's trying to help us live our lives better day to day. It's something that I can turn to and read and study on a daily basis and learn more about better faithful living to the Lord. This is our second lesson in the study of Proverbs and we begin as we think about topical subjects that Proverbs addresses. One of the things that we find in this book is that the Bible tells us and Proverbs tells us how to choose friends wisely and how to be a good friend. I want you to notice what Proverbs chapter 1 and verse number 10 says. When we think about wisdom from the book of Proverbs, this is one of those premier passages. Notice Proverbs 1 verse 10. The Bible says, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. When we think about practical wisdom as it relates to friends, God's message is, don't let your friends tell you what to do or make you do things you don't want to do. Don't let them entice you. Rather, you be a good example. Young people, listen carefully. You're going to have friends at times who are going to try to entice you. Uh, things that may be alluring, whether it be of the flesh or of the mind, they're going to try to entice you to do things. God's message is do not consent. Don't give in. If someone says, hey, let's go over here and drink this beer. Hey, let's go back here and smoke this cigarette or marijuana. Or if, or if some young lady or some young man is in a difficult situation morally, don't give in to it. Don't let them entice you into doing wrong. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, that evil companions corrupt good morals. And so we need to stand up for what's right. I don't want to be one who goes along with the crowd. I want to be one who stands up for what's right. Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Go against the grain. Do what's right no matter what. Be like Joseph. Even if it means facing persecution, do the right thing no matter what. A second principle then we learn about friends is that you must choose your friends very, very carefully. This is one of those passages that just kind of jumps out at you. Look at Proverbs chapter 12 and verse number 26. The Bible gives us this advice as it relates to friends. Proverbs 12 verse 26 says, The righteous should choose his friends carefully. Why? For the way of the wicked leads them astray. Don't just let anybody into your inner circle of your closest friends. The Bible says that we're not to have any fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Rather, we're to expose them. And so another very, very practical lesson is choose friends wisely. The people who I choose to be my friends I have the, the power of influence over them at times and sometimes they may influence me. And if they're not living right and doing right, then they may influence me for wrong. And so you want to choose people who try to live the right way. Choose friends who've got the same goals in mind as you do. If your goal is to seek first the kingdom, 
Matthew 6, 33, choose friends who are going to help you to do that. If you recognize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and you want to glorify God with all that you have, choose friends who also have that mindset and definitely choose friends who are faithful members of the Lord's church who will encourage you to go to heaven. Don't choose friends who use language, vulgar language that you don't use. Like it or not, those words go into your head often enough you're going to think those things. Don't choose friends who are involved in immoral or ungodly or wicked practices. They may eventually rub off on you. And then a very important lesson that we learn about friends from the book of Proverbs is that to have friends, you've got to be friendly. Reciprocation is a definite part of friendship. Look at Proverbs chapter 18 and notice what verse number 24 says. A man who has friends must himself be friendly, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. How is it that you can have friends? Be friendly. That's simple, that's plain, that's common sense. If I want to have friends, then I've got to be friendly. I've got to be kind. I've got to be pleasant. I've got to be somebody who is a joy to be around. I don't want to be somebody who's a sour all the time, somebody who doesn't enjoy life or doesn't have a positive outlook. To be friendly is the key way. Being friendly is the key way to gain friends. And of course, I want to be friendly to everybody so that I can reach as many folks as possible with the gospel of Christ. Being friendly is the key to evangelism. Everybody likes someone who smiles. Everybody likes somebody who's got a pleasant word and a positive, enthusiastic outlook on life. That's the kind of person you'd all like to be friends with. And that's the kind of people who can do the most good for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then as we study subjects in the book of Proverbs that are very practical for Christian living, we think about what Proverbs has to say concerning parenting. In a day and age where the home is under attack, when parents sometimes aren't the parents they ought to be, and sometimes even the child is more responsible than the parent, and in homes when they're single parents, what does God's Word have to say practically about parenting? First and foremost, the Bible teaches us that parents must train their children. Look in Proverbs chapter 22, verse number 6. The Bible says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. As a general principle, if you train children in the right way, they'll stay true to that path. And so the parent's responsibility and the emphasis from this passage is the training. Children don't good Christian children happen, don't just magically happen. They're trained in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. They grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. 2 Peter 3, verse 18. If the Word of God and good Christian role models of living for Christ are seen every day, that's how you train children to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Another principle about parenting that we learn from the book of Proverbs, and this is really what we're trying to stress, is that discipline, training and discipline are both essential to making and producing godly children. I want you to take just a moment and follow with me as we think about what the Bible says concerning discipline as a part of training. The first passage is found in Proverbs chapter 13 and I want you to notice what verse number 24 says. The Bible says, He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Long ago, Dr. Spock said, and many people bought into it, that if, if you spank your children, you're going to squash their little spirits and you're going to do untold damage to them. He later recanted that and even himself said it was wrong and one of the great disasters to the American home and family. But the damage was in many ways done. But friend, all along, 
God had said, if you spare the rod, in essence, you're going to lead your son to destruction. You know, you know, we hear the phrase, spare the rod and spoil the child. That is not in the Bible, but it likely is found in Proverbs 13, verse 24. If you, the Bible says, he who spares his rod hates his son. That's kind of the idea. And so God says discipline is essential in training. Now, I want you to notice another passage in Proverbs chapter 19, verse number 18. The Bible says, in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 18, Chasten your son while there is hope, and do not set your heart on his destruction. Chasten, correct, discipline is the idea. Discipline him while there's hope, while they're still fashionable and moldable. As young children, they need to be corrected. If children do things that are not according to the will of God in that training period, sometimes discipline, sometimes even spankings are necessary for helping them to be the people God wants them to be. Now, turn your attention to Proverbs chapter 22, verse number 15. The Bible says, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. All of us can think of times in our own life where as a child maybe we did things that were highly foolish and, and maybe at times we just weren't even thinking about what we were doing. Just out there having fun and doing things and never really considered the consequences or responsibility. Sometimes foolishness is bound up in the heart of the child. It's almost kind of natural sometimes when kids have that knack, but the Bible says the rod of correction will drive that far from them. We need to help our children see that you can't live life as a fool. You can't just go by the, the impulse and the whim. You've got to make good choices and you've got to do the right thing and it is the rod of correction. Discipline, training, spankings that will help with that. Now, another passage and listen to the language of Proverbs 23 verses 13 and 14. The Bible says, Do not withhold correction from a child, for if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. Now, when God here, when the proverb writer in the language speaks of beatings, we're not talking about physical abuse in the sense of someone actually causing harm, beating up on somebody in that sense. Rather, this would be parallel to our word of spanking or paddling. If you spank your child, he's not going to die. It may seem like it at times, but it's not going to kill him. Rather, God says, you'll save his soul. A lot of people say, don't spank your children. If you spank them, you don't really love them. You know what God says? God says the exact opposite of that. God says, if you spank them, you'll help them on their journey to heaven. You'll teach them and enforce and impress upon their mind what's right and wrong, and that discipline will remind them, hey, there's a boundary here, there's a guideline, and I must not go beyond that. Proverbs 29, verse 15 is the last passage concerning discipline that I want you to look at. Notice what the Scripture says. The rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself Bring shame to his mother. Correcting, discipline, spankings, those are not bad things. What's bad? Children that are just left to themselves. Children that virtually have no training. That although a home may be provided, although clothing and meals may be provided, in learning how to live, they basically raise themselves. Friend, listen carefully. If you don't train your children, someone will. And you don't want, I'll guarantee you, if you live by Christian principles, you don't want the public school system training your children. You don't want society and the media training your children. It's not the church's job to train your children. That responsibility lies squarely on our shoulders as parents. And we must do our part to train them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1 through 4. Another subject that the book of Proverbs deals with 
relates to husbands and wives and the, the creating of good marriages and good relationships. What does the Bible say about how to have a happy and healthy marriage relationship? Proverbs speaks about this. In Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 22, we learn a great gem of wisdom as it relates to making marriages work, and it's this. Realize the value of your spouse. Look at Proverbs 18, verse number 22. The scripture says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. This could go for a husband or a wife. Who finds a wife? He who finds a husband? You find a good thing. What are we saying? They're valuable. It's something that is essential to having that family unit and to helping one another get to heaven. You see, we weren't created to go through this life alone. God saw that in Genesis 2, 18 when He said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Genesis 2, 18. And thus, out of the dust of the ground, the Lord God created Eve. Uh, she was a helpmate for him. And God said, Genesis 2, verse 24, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Nobody wants to live life as a loner. Friend, if that's the case and you're married, realize the value of a godly spouse. Don't take them for granted. Don't think it's just a given. Rather, treat it like a treasure and do those things that will give it the honor and glory that she or he deserves. Then as it relates to husband and wives, we learn that the key in marriage is trust. Notice the virtuous wife and what her husband does with her in Proverbs 31 or what her husband thinks about her in Proverbs 31 verse 11. The scripture says, The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. In her business ventures, in the things that she's doing with the children, with the home, in her activities, he's not wondering where is she at and what is she doing and who is she running around with. She's proven herself. And as a result, trust binds that relationship together. Now, trust is something that has to be earned. It has to be gained over experience, over time, over the dealing with situations. We learn to trust one another. But friend, it's key in marriage. Don't put yourself as a husband or a wife in a situation that isn't trustworthy. And make sure that you do your part to build that trust in the relationship. And then when that's been proven, we need to have the confidence to fully trust one another without doubt, without question, know that we have each other's best interest in heart. Now, one last principle, and that's simply this. Both in a marriage, both husbands and wife need to make sure not to nag or complain or to be negative. Negativity will never, ever make the marriage work. Look at Proverbs chapter 19, verse number 13. The scripture says in Proverbs 19, 13, A foolish son is the ruin of his father, and the contentions of a wife are like a continual dripping. Can you imagine and can you remember how aggravating and bothersome maybe a drippy faucet is? You ever had a, a drippy faucet in the sink? Or one maybe in a shower or a bathtub and just drip, drip after that over and over again. How that grates on your nerves after a while. The Bible says for marriage to work, you can't get to that point. If there's continual nagging, and in this context, you know, it mentions the wife, but it could just as well be the husband. Both have that potential to nag if we're not careful. And so we don't want to be negative. We don't want to be down in each other. I don't want to always be harping on what's negative or wrong if correction needs to be made. Even then, there's a right and positive way to do that. And so don't complain. Don't, don't nag all the time if you want the marriage to really be what God wants it to be. Remember, that's like a drippy faucet and nobody wants to have that. You'll correct that as soon as you can, and so it ought to be corrected in the marriage just as well. Then as we think about the book of Proverbs and some of its 
practical teachings, one thing that we certainly learn from this book is that sin is a horrible, horrible thing and that it has horrible consequences that man will have to face if he doesn't deal with and remedy the sin problem according to God's plan. What passage do we notice first? I want you to look at Proverbs chapter 14 and verse number 9. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 14 verse 9, Fools mock at sin, but among the upright there is favor. First and foremost, as it relates to sin, we learn that, that sin is not a laughing matter. Friend, this will tell you how far we've come in society. It's got so bad and we have become so desensitized to sin that we actually say a good dessert is so good it's sinful. Friend, if we really understood what that means and what the consequences of that are, You'd never designate sin as a descriptive word for anything pleasurable. And so when we think about sin, let's realize sin's not a laughing matter. Oh, society may laugh at it. People in the world around us may laugh at it. And they may say, come join us in this sin. But friend, let's realize sin's not a laughing matter because sin is what sent the Savior to the world to suffer and die for mankind. Is it a laughing matter when you think about what Jesus had to endure? Is it really that funny when you think about what the Savior went through so men could be forgiven of their sin? Secondly, from the book of Proverbs, we learn that man alone, he's incapable of dealing with the sin problem by himself. Look at Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number 9. Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 9 says this, who can say, I have made my heart clean, I am pure from sin. Now, the question is not who can be clean from sin and who can be pure from sin, but the question is who can say, I've made my heart clean, I am pure from sin. The emphasis is upon the individual making himself clean from sin. And of course, no one can say that. Romans 3.23, the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The scripture teaches there's, not, there's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3 verse 10, and in the long ago, the great prophet Jeremiah taught us that man can't save himself from sin. Do you remember Jeremiah 10 verse 23? Jeremiah said, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself, it is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Man can't deal with the sin problem and thus we need a Savior. You shall call his name Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. Matthew 1 verses 19 through 21. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 9 verse 22. And yet Jesus said, as he instituted the Lord's Supper in the taking of the Passover, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Matthew 26 and verse 28. And friend, that leads us to the final thing that the book of Proverbs says on the subject of sin and its consequences. I want you to notice Proverbs chapter 28 and verse number 13. That's Proverbs 28 verse 13. Scripture says... He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. How do you deal with the sin problem? If you try to cover it, you're not going to prosper. That means that you can't sweep sin under the rug. You, you can't ignore it and act like it isn't there. You can't think that you're bigger than sin. doesn't take care of the sin problem in dealing with it that way. And so covering the sin is not an option. And here's the reason it's not an option. No matter how hard you cover it, how deep you dig that hole, you can't hide it from God. All things are naked and open before the eyes of Him with whom we must give an account. Hebrews 4 verse 13, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good 
and the evil. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 13. And the scripture there says, as it did in Proverbs 15, 3, even the secret things God knows. But then notice the second part of that verse. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them, that's the one who will find mercy. You know, the Bible says in the New Testament words similar to this. The scripture says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just as the proverb writer said, so today it's true, I've got to be willing to own up to and acknowledge sin so that I can deal with it. And then, as proverb writer said in Proverbs 28, 13, you also must be willing to forsake sin. You've got to do your best to turn away from and stop living a life of sin. That's what repentance is all about. Repent and turn again that your sins may be blotted out. Acts 3 verse 19. Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Luke 13, 3. And so today, we ask you, have you let God tell you how to deal with the sin problem? Have you dealt with it according to God's way? Here's what Jesus said initially. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Have you done that? Have you heard the Word of God? Do you believe in Jesus as His Son? Are you willing to confess and forsake sin? And would you make that great confession and be immersed in water? If you've never done that, we encourage you today. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost Christ souls, not your walk. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 